Good day and welcome to Learn Extra Lessons for Grade 11. Today we're going to be looking at trade and development. We are going to do some key concepts, look at some important definitions, go through some explanations about what's important and finally get on to some questions and how we should answer those questions. Okay, so our first um, topic for discussion today is we're going to look at the key concepts under trade and development and make sure that you know what is important in this particular topic. So we're going to be discussing the following. We're going to be looking at international trade and basically what we mean by that is when two countries or more than two countries are trading goods across the world in terms of supplying and the demand that exists for those products. We're also going to be looking at the world markets, we're going to look at commodities, that's the goods and that that are traded and terms of trade because certain countries have different conditions that are needed when countries trade with them. Okay, we're also going to be looking at the types of our trading relationships. We've got free trade, we have trade barriers, subsidies, as well as fair trade that we will be discussing this morning. The concept of globalization is very important. It's becoming a worldwide thing where most countries around the world are trading goods with each other. And then lastly, we will look at export-led development, and that is how certain countries are becoming more developed due to the amount of exports that they are sending out of their countries. Okay, so the first thing that's very important is we need to know our definitions. And we have quite a few definitions to get through. Some of them we're just going to read because they will be explained later on. All right, so the first definition, obviously, in terms of trade and development, is to have a basic understanding as to what trading is about. And if you look on the screen, it says, trading is the exchange of goods and services, capital, labor, and information between any two parties. All right, if we move on to barter, barter is a form of early sort of trade that took place between nations and it's a very similar concept to trading where basically we are exchanging goods for other goods and in terms of bartering you will notice that we sell or oh sorry bartering is when we actually just exchange the goods for each other rather than selling them for a particular profit. When we look at international trade Let's just put it a bit higher. We are looking at trade that is happening between two countries. So our entire definition says it's the exchange of goods, services, capital and labor between actual countries. So it's very similar to the definition of trade. It's just now we um, including that it's happening between two specific countries. When we look at our balance of trade is the relationship that exists between the exports and and the imports that are going in and out of a country. Very important to know that when we are exporting goods, the country is sending the goods away from their shores, and if we import certain products, we are bringing them into our country. When we look at the market, okay, this is quite an important one when we look at trade and development. The market is the place where goods and services are bought and sold. Okay, so basically it's the area in which the exchange of goods will take place. Our commodities, okay, those refer to the actual items that are up for sale in terms of our trading, okay, and it refers to anything that is found in very large quantities. All right. Free trade is one of the important ways trade takes place that we'll look at in more detail later on. And it's trade that occurs without any restrictions. So the key word in that definition is restrictions. We can have trade taking place between two countries and there are no laws set that this is how these trading relationships should take place. Our tariffs okay is a type of tax so we're looking at that keyword okay which is placed on imported goods remember imported goods are goods that are coming into your country and it makes these goods more expensive than the local products so tariffs are there to actually try and protect the local economy and rather use the local products as opposed to importing them from other countries in terms of customs Okay, 
taxes paid on importing and the exporting of goods. If any of you have been on an aeroplane, you will know that you have to go through customs when you return from another country, or if you are leaving our country, you have to pass through customs and declare any goods in terms of the taxation on those products. Right, our quota, okay, is basically defined as a limit to the amount of goods that may enter a country during a fixed period of time. So we don't want too much of one particular item entering into South Africa. It will then decrease pr um, prices because the more supply you have of something, the lower the price for something else becomes. If we look at subsidies, Okay, a subsidy is a form of financial assistance that is usually paid by a government to an industry or certain economic sector. They, in simple terms, it's there to try and help those financial areas and to improve the local produce within a particular country. Fair trade is another type of trade that we will be looking at in more detail. It's trade that supports farmers in developing countries, okay, so the key word there is developing, by paying fair prices and encouraging social and environmental development within those communities. So fair trade tries to encourage local produce on the international market and it's a means of trying to get the developing countries to improve their economy. All right, globalization, we will look at in more detail as well, but basically, or generally speaking, globalization leads to an integrated global economy. What they say with globalization is that our borders have disappeared, um, trade happens, a lot of companies are now moving across worldwide, places like McDonald's you can find in almost every single country, and that is the whole idea behind globalization. In terms of multinational um, corporations, this has a lot to do with globalization. And if you look at the definition on screen, it's a company that owns or controls production facilities in more than one country. So they're operating their businesses worldwide and have different manufacturing plants set up in more than one country. When we refer to outsourcing, okay, it's basically referring to having components made or assembled in a country other than where the headquarters of that country is based. So for example, in South Africa, we have the Volkswagen manufacturing car plant and the headquarters of Volkswagen are actually held in Germany. So they use our country to build and produce their um, products and the actual headquarters sit in Germany. Right, sweatshops. Okay, a sweatshop is defined as the following. It says, it is a workshop or factory where people work long hours in poor conditions for low pay and they often make illegal or what's referred to as counterfeit goods. What we mean by illegal or counterfeit goods is the DVDs that you buy from the robot. Those are illegal, they're not produced properly, they can sell them for a lot cheaper and these are the kind of things that are produced in what's referred to as a sweatshop. Then lastly, export-led development is our last section that we'll look at before we'll do some questions. But what it's defined as is an economic strategy used by developing nations okay, um, to catch up to the developed nations through increasing their wealth through their exports. So, in a basic terms, that these countries or these developing nations are exporting many, many goods and through that process and increasing their income to their country, they will start to head towards becoming a developed nation. All right, so in a brief, those were the most important definitions that you should be paying attention to. And like I said, some of them are going to be repeated in the next few slides. Okay, so the first thing that we need to look at under the heading of trade and development is obviously the different types of trade that are taking place around our world. And it says on the screen that the following. Okay, it says, trade can be the, described as the transfer of goods and services from one person or entity to another. When they refer to an entity, <coughs> 
excuse me, that could be from one country to another, it could be from one um, particular company to another company, anything like that is meant or under the heading of an entity. In its simplest form, trade is a process where people or entities barter. We've looked at that definition of barter, okay? One side provides the goods and services and the other side provides the money or alternate goods and services which that country may or may not need. All right, when we look at international trade, it involves the movement of goods and services across borders. And that's what I've said to you before, is the main difference between what is trading and what is international trading. So you could have trading within a specific country, or as soon as you start moving goods across the world, we then move on to what's referred to as international trade. Trade between two countries is what we refer to as bilateral trade. In other words, the, the key part of that word being by meaning to and trade between more than two countries is known as multinational trade okay so it's very important to understand what is meant by bilateral trade trade between two countries and multinational trade is trade taking place between more than two countries you will just see the image on the screen shows the amount of trading partners around the world okay so you have many different key parts and those goods and services are moving worldwide. All right, underneath that, we look at commodities, okay? Commodities are items that the countries trade, all right? So they're the goods and services that are moving from one country to another. They can either be in the form of raw materials or finished products. But what's important to know about commodities is that if commodities or if you're exporting commodities that are raw materials, the amount of money that you get for raw materials is much less than if you are exporting processed or manufactured goods. So if your country is exporting goods in the finished product, they are going to have a much higher value of exports. LEDCs, okay, we've discussed this before in previous units, but that refers to less economically developed countries. So it's talking about our developing nations and they export predominantly raw materials and unfinished goods so their share of the global trade is very small because they are not getting a large amount of money for their goods on the other hand MEDCs which is your more economically developed countries MEDCs earn a lot higher profit in terms of the export revenue because they are sending out um, processed goods and therefore they cost a lot more money to other countries. Okay, below that you can just see some examples of different products that are exported around the country. Okay, and now we need to look at our terms of trade. All right, in terms of trade, it says, it is a term used by economists to describe the relationship between the prices a country sells its exports for and the price that it pays for its imports. And what we mean by that is obviously countries, their main goal in terms of their economy is try and get the most amount of money for their exports and pay the least amount of money Money for their imports because then as a country their balance of trade is going to be exceptionally good. So that brings us on to our next point which is the balance of trade and all countries especially countries that would like to become developed nations need to have what we call a positive balance of trade. If we look at the definition it says the balance of trade is another important term to understand. It's the relationship between the value of a country's export and its imports and that balance of trade is either going to be positive or negative you will find that most more economically developed countries generally speaking have a positive balance of trade and less economically developed countries have a negative balance of trade so when we look at a negative balance of trade or a positive balance of trade we will see that for a negative balance of trade our imports are greater than our exports Okay, so in other words, our country is bringing in more um, manufactured and processed goods and possibly exporting goods in their raw material stage. And therefore, we have a severe negative balance. On the other hand, developed countries have a positive balance of trade 
where the exports are much greater than our import. And most developed nations, that's what they're going to be striving for, is to have a positive balance of trade where we are exporting more goods in their um, processed stage and getting a higher revenue for those goods. All right, if we look at the different types of trade relationships, okay, these are the different things that exist between countries around the world. We have three main types, okay? We can break them down into free trade, trade barriers, and fair trade. We've discussed these as part of the definitions, and now we're going to look at them in a bit more detail. Okay, so if we go to free trade, it says the following says it is trade that occurs without any restrictions so that part is essentially the most important thing you need to remember about free trade is that trade will take place without any restrictions having been placed by any governments around the world when there is free trade the nations open their borders to one another okay and goods and services move freely between the different countries there are no tariffs or customs that might increase the price of these products free trade is meant to benefit all trading partners so free trade is the majority of the trade that takes place in our country today and basically the most important thing like I've said is to know that free trade happens without any restrictions if we look at trade barriers okay these are quite important because different countries have different rules and regulations. So it says trade barriers occur in order to protect local manufacturers. You want to try and encourage local industry within your own country before you start to import goods from other nations. Um, governments might introduce measures to make the imported goods more expensive. So this is their way of trying to say, well, actually, you need to support the local industry. So we're going to put huge tariffs on these imported goods. And in that way, those imported goods are going to be more expensive. So the different ways in which the government can do this is by using import tariffs and taxes okay now import tariffs and taxes are taxes placed on imported goods which make them more expensive than the local goods so you have let's for example say we're importing um, a camera from Japan and we're going to place a tax on that camera so that it's more expensive than a locally produced camera for example sake the another thing the governments can do is subsidize our local industries and when we talk about subsidies it says it is financial assistance that gets paid to businesses to help support that specific business it creates employment stimulates business and it reduces the amount of imports into a particular country so what local governments can do is they, they can identify certain products that are being produced locally and give a lot of subsidies to those businesses and encourage the development within their own country. In terms of using quotas, it's another barrier that governments can impose. It, uh, or, sorry, quotas are limits that the government sets to the amount of imported goods that can enter a country within a particular time frame. So those are just different ways in which the governments can try and support local industry. Trade barriers are also used in order to protect jobs within a country, okay? It's to protect local products from foreign competition and to encourage our local industries. All right, fair trade is now quite an interesting one. It's actually quite new and something that's becoming very important. When we speak about fair trade, it's trade that supports particularly farmers within developing countries, okay? By paying fair prices, workers enjoy better working conditions and are not exploited for the work that they do. This type of trade is closely linked to sustainable development and fair trade 
trade organizations also improve infrastructure and social development within developing countries. So fair trade is very much based in terms of supporting developing nations and trying to make sure that they are not exploited by any means. And underneath you can see that there is a specific logo that is used in terms of fair trade. And when you are buying products, which we'll look at in a minute, as long as those products are bearing this logo, you can know that you are buying a product that has been supported by fair trade. Okay, and it says goods marked with this fair trade logo guarantee disadvantaged farmers in the developing world get a better deal. So the next time you go and try and buy something at the shop, try and see if you can find this fair trade logo. We've just got two examples here. You can see the fair trade logo located on the Kit Kats as well as on the different types of bananas. So try and make a difference. Go out next time you're in the grocery store and see if you can specifically spot products that are bearing this fair trade logo. All right, globalization, we mentioned it within our definitions. Okay, it says it is a process whereby the increased flow of goods and services as well as capital technology, ideas, information and people between countries leads to an integrated global economy and society. The key definite or key part of globalization is this last bit here where they speak about an integrated global economy and society and what they essentially mean by that is that we've had the transfer of goods and services and the ideas that are being shared around the world it has resulted in some brands spreading right across the globe and if you just look at the graphic on um, the, the screen you will see that there are different products that you probably can recognize things like Nokia in terms of your cell phone Microsoft sorry Microsoft Nescafe uh, McDonald's, Gillette, Coca-Cola, there are many products that if you travel around the world you are able to come upon and get your hands upon. Some examples below that you should hopefully identify those following logos places like McDonald's, Volkswagen, Shell, they are worldwide companies and the reason these companies have been able to spread is due to the process of globalization. All right. Globalization and development. Let's just pull that up a bit. Globalization has impacted development in different ways, okay? And we're gonna look at some of those ways because like I've said, it's basically referring to the fact that the borders around our world have disappeared and there is no longer any restrictions placed. In terms of trade, globalization has increased the trading around the world. Countries that were previously disadvantaged through globalization have become more advantaged and can freely trade with the rest of the world. In terms of migration, people themselves can now move freely within their own countries. They can choose to immigrate to other countries. Globalization has made the migration of the human race possible. Economic growth, um, globalization has helped developing countries to improve their export market and in that way is leading to a more stronger economic growth within those developing nations. Multinational corporations, we've spoken about that, is basically a company that has branches across the world in different countries. Open borders, all right, allows the movement of people. Open borders allows the fair trade, anything like that. Global governance, in other words, we are moving things, global um, governments from one country on another in negotiations with other countries. And in terms of communication, globalization has opened that door and it just keeps on increasing. If you look at the different types of cell phones that are available now, iPads, it's increased the amount of communication we have. You literally can speak to someone living 12,000 kilometers away in an instant due to the processes like globalization. Right, um, basically, just a quick recap of the different things that we've looked at there. You can, I'll just highlight a few things on the screen. 
trade is now easier to trade and exchange goods we've spoken about that communication countries are better linked okay and they are able to now share knowledge with each other like I said at the click of a button you can speak to someone who's 12,000 kilometers away global governance international communities are trying to regulate global economic activities and minimize environmental damage I think that's probably the most important one when we speak about global governance is that all countries around the world have now taken a decision to decrease environmental degradation. Open borders, borders become less important, it allows the freer movement of people um, as well as the movement of goods and ideas across the world. Multinational corporations control the world, resources operate globally, we spoke about them having headquarters in more than one country. Economic growth, okay, it stimulates production and trade which ultimately leads to the economies especially of the developing countries growing. Migration, move people within countries as well as across the borders. And those are predominantly the results of globalization. Okay, our last section is what we refer to as export-led development. And the best example of export-led development is the growing economy of China. We're going to look at why that's the best example. It says export-led development is an economic strategy used by developing nations. So it's predominantly used by the developing countries. And the idea behind this export-led de um, development is that these developing nations want to try and catch up to the developed countries of the world. And their aim is to increase their wealth, okay, by increasing their exports out of their country. And if they increase their wealth, they're going to increase their level of development because their economy is going to get stronger. The way they plan to increase exports is that they invest in industries, okay? So manufacturing as well as in education in order to create specialized export products. So what they essentially do is they focus all their attention on getting the best products to export out of their country. They then reinvest the money into social and physical structure of their country. So in terms of socially, they pump all their money back into education and in terms of the physical structure, they improve the infrastructure within that country. Countries such as Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan and South Korea have become more developed using this approach. And like I said, the most recent example of export-led development is the Chinese example. All right, I hope you've enjoyed the explanation on trade and development. There are really some exciting things here, especially like I said, go and find your fair trade logos. Make sure that you are supporting products that are locally produced in your own country. Make sure you're supporting products that have been um, developed through fair trade and learn your definitions as well as the important concepts. After the break, we're going to be looking at some questions that you can be expected to to answer in terms of trade and development. Welcome back after the break. We're now going to look at some questions that you can expect on the topic of trade and development. So question one is basically just simple questions based on the information that we've looked at in the first half of the show. And the first question says the following, what is free trade? So they're literally looking for a definition and this is why I said to you that you need to study your definitions so that you are able to easily write them out and the most important thing with when we are looking at what is free trade is I've said to you before it is trade without restrictions okay and that is the key word is that this trading or well, this trading can take place across the countries without any restrictions placed by either one of the countries that is involved in the trading process so when you learn your definitions free trade is about trading where no restrictions are in place Okay, question two, what are trade barriers and why are the trade barriers necessary for protecting employment? 
So this question has got two parts. The first half is what are the trade barriers? So they literally are expecting you to be able to write down that you know what the trade barriers are. And when we've looked at those kind of things, we, we looked at tariffs and customs. Okay, we've looked at subsidies. And we have looked at quotas. Those were the three different types of trade barriers that we looked at under our explanation. They are now saying to you, why are those barriers necessary for protecting employment? And the type of employment that they are trying to protect is basically our local employment within our own country. So trade barriers are used to protect local industries from being overthrown by goods that are imported from other countries. In terms of protecting employment, if these um, barriers are used, then your local industries are protected. By protecting the local industries, you are also alternative, um, simultaneously protecting the jobs of those local people. And that is why we need to use the same three, okay? So you've got to learn what the trade barriers are and how they can affect things like protecting employment within a particular country. Question 1.3 then says, what do you understand by the term exploitation? So if I say to you, people living in South Africa are exploited, explain what this term exploited means. When we refer to exploitation, we are referring to using a product or a person and basically putting that under pressure and using it until it cannot be used anymore. So if we exploit something, we are using it beyond its means of being used any further. So if we exploit um, mineral resources in a country, we are using them to the point where we no longer be able to get those minerals out of the ground and use them toward the development of that country. 1.4 says, in what ways do subsidies benefit activities or industries? Subsidies was one of the ways in which a country or a form of a trade barrier that countries can impose. So what they're asking for now is how do these subsidies, and remember subsidies are financial grants that are given by the government to local industries to support that particular product. So how do those subsidies benefit activities or industries? Well, it basically gives them a financial inflow. They can produce more of their product. Um, they are able to keep the majority of the people that they are are employing in their jobs for much longer and in this way they can start to grow their local product at a much greater rate. Provide one South African example of a company that will benefit from subsidies. I'm sure you've all heard of Sassel. Okay, it is the petroleum company and the way that subsidies benefit Sassel is because oil is such um, a volatile import from around the world. And what I mean by volatile is one day the price of oil increases, the next day it decreases. So what the subsidy from the South African government does for Sassel is that it protects them against that volatility in the market. It can keep on producing its product and and if the price of petrol drops the one day, it's still kind of supported. And if the price of petrol increases, Sassel can still continue to produce their products and not be at risk of losing their company within South Africa. Last question for question one, what is fair trade and how does it benefit the people in the production line? So once again, it's a bit of a, a, a double backed question. You've got to explain what is fair trade and secondly, you've got to say how it's affecting or benefiting the people in the production line. What we mean by production line is basically if you take a product in its raw stage and you get to it in its manufactured or process stage, certain people have been involved along the way from getting that product from its raw stage into a manufactured stage. So let's start with what is fair trade, okay? Fair trade is where trade is 
um, focused on protecting the developing nations and protecting local industries within a country. And the reason or the way in which it protects the people within that production line is that the money that is gained from the finished product is split evenly down the production line. What we often find in terms of goods is that the person who is selling the finished product receives all the income for that product and pays minimal amounts to the people within the production line. Under fair trade, the money that is earned from that final product is split evenly with the people who I have or have been involved in the production from its start to its finished product. Okay, question two says, refer to the table below showing some of South Africa's trading partners and answer the questions that follow. Remember, trading partners is any country that South Africa will um, exchange goods with. We can send them goods, we can import goods from their country, and that's what we refer to as a trading partner. So in the table, you will see we have China, the United Kingdom, and Saudi Arabia. And we've got two columns. Um, we've got exports, percentage of total exports, and we've got imports, which is the percentage of total imports. Exports, just a reminder, are goods that are going out of your country, and imports are goods that are being brought into your own country. So if we just look at the information, China, we export 11% of our total exports, which is quite a high percentage. We import 14% of all goods into South Africa are coming from China. The United Kingdom we send about 5% of our exports and we only import about 4% of their goods. Saudi Arabia we don't send any exports out but we do import a lot from Saudi Arabia. So the first question says, according to the information, which country is South Africa's largest international trading partner? And if we go to the table, we can see that 11% of goods are exported to China and 14% of goods are imported, which will actually ultimately make China our largest trading partner. So it doesn't matter if our imports are more than our exports in general and generally speaking, our trading with China is sitting at a very, very high level. It says 2.2. Suggest a commodity that South Africa would export to China. In other words, what is produced within our own country that the Chinese population could want to have from our country. And one of the most important things that we do export, and we do it quite well, is we have wine, Okay, coming from the Western Cape. We also have a lot of um, fruit, okay, in terms of grapes, those kind of things coming out of the Western Cape. Um, our flowers are generally of quite a high quality, which are exported around the world. So any sort of products like that, which China may not be able to um, grow or produce in its own country. 2.3, the most likely commodity South Africa would import from Saudi Arabia and it's possibly one of the biggest commodities around the world and that import is what we refer to as oil and predominantly it is crude oil, okay? That is the um, substance that we use in the manufacturing of petrol and South Africa is a country that relies on the use of a lot of petrol. 2.4 says, if the Chinese economy was to experience difficulties and enter recession, predict how this would affect development in South Africa. Now that word recession, okay, implies that the economy has ceased to grow and it is now decreasing in terms of the economic production in that country. We've just discussed in question 2.1 that China is South Africa's greatest trading partner. So if our greatest trading partner has gone into economic decline because of a recession, it's going to have serious effects on the development of South Africa. We are getting a huge amount 
of revenue from the um, exports that are going off to China. And as soon as a country goes into recession, they will stop trade with a country and say, we actually cannot trade with you anymore. And South Africa will lose 11% of what it's importing to China. We lose that 11% and South Africa starts to go into an economic decline as a result of our biggest trading partner being in economic decline. So in terms of answering this question, it says if the Chinese economy was to experience the difficulties at enter recession, predict how this would affect development, it's going to cause a negative effect on development in in South Africa. Our development will go back into a decline, our economy will go into recession and when your economy and everything is in recession the amount of development a country can undergo is very limited. 2.5. Is South Africa's balance of trade with these countries positive or negative? Now going back to what we explained about um, balance of trade, if your exports are greater than your imports you will have a positive balance of trade if your imports are greater than your exports you have a negative balance of trade so the two countries that we're looking at for question 2.5 is china and the united kingdom if we go back to our table and we look at the percentages okay you will see that with China our exports are only 11% and our imports are 14% therefore the imports are greater which means that it would be a negative balance of trade with China if we look at the United Kingdom our exports are sitting at 5% our imports at 4% which means with the United Kingdom South Africa actually has a positive trade balance okay so in other words when you are looking at your balance of trade it is either going to be negative or positive okay if it is negative your imports all right are greater than your exports and if it is positive your exports are greater than your imports okay so China we discussed would be negative as our exports oh sorry our imports are more and the United Kingdom has a positive balance of trade with South Africa because our exports are greater 2.6 says China has developed rapidly following an export-led model of development. Explain what this means as well as critically examining advantages and disadvantages of this particular path. All right, so once again, we need to break this question up. They want to know what is an export-led model and they want to know advantages and disadvantages of following this particular pattern of development. So what the export-led model is, as a reminder, is where a country focuses all its attention on exporting high quality goods out of the country in order to e increase economic growth. That is in a nutshell what export-led development is, okay? It's part of the name, export-led development. Advantages of export-led development is that you generate an extremely high revenue for your goods and services. Um, your economy starts to grow. Okay? When your economy starts to grow, your services and your standard of living within your country become a lot greater. When the things like that start to improve, the quality of life of your population starts to increase. So there's a number of um, advantages that a country experiences when they undergo export-led development. On the other hand though, the disadvantages are much greater. If we are focusing as a country on export export-led development, we are using an excess amount of our mineral resources. 
okay so we are trying to produce as much as we can within a short period of time in order to grow our economy we're putting extreme pressure on the environment because in terms of exporting high quality goods you need a lot of industrialization that industrialization causes massive amounts of air pollution and as a result of that, the um, disadvantages continue to grow. So there's many, many different ideas here, but those are just some of the main topics in terms of advantages and disadvantages. Okay, if we look at question three now, question three is quite an exciting question. It's be, we've been given some diagrams that we can look at, and it's a really relevant example in terms of development and factories within South Africa. So question three says, Tata is a large motor vehicle manufacturer with its head office in India. The company expanded its truck assembly chain by opening a factory in Roslyn near Pretoria in July 2011. So it's quite a current thing, it happened two years ago. Um, they've obviously seen a gap for development within South Africa. Question one then says, and you've been given diagrams, and I can't stress enough grade 11s, that when you are given diagrams or given an information briefing, read them. Some of the answers may be within those um, given uh, resources. Name a product manufactured by the Tata company. So if we look at our resources, the most obvious answer to all of us is they are producing cars. The second picture is producing trucks. Okay, those are the obvious things. This company might produce other goods and services, but from the resources that we are given, and if you know nothing about Tata, look at the resources and therefore you can answer those questions. Right, in which country did the Tata company originate? So once again, you might look at that and think, oh, I don't know, okay? But if you go back to the little bit of information in the resources they gave you, it says it has its head office in India. So if its head office is there, generally speaking, that is where the company originated. So in terms of Tata, its head office is in India. How can, question 3.3, the Tata company benefit by opening a branch in South Africa? Now, most of these benefits are the same benefits worldwide as to why a company opens another branch within a different country. They're looking for things like cheap resources. Okay, so South Africa might have a large quantity of the resources that this truck manufacturing plant may be. Okay, they're looking for cheap labor. So they come to a country like South Africa where, you know, we have labor laws in place, but we can still offer cheap amounts of labor to these processing um, places. Maybe they also want to expand their market within South Africa. By putting plants in here, they grow relationships with South Africa as a country. Explain why Tata may be regarded as a multinational corporation. We've looked at a definition of multinational corporations and the definition is basically because it has, um, how can we put it, uh, I think we should say something along the lines of they've got companies, okay, or you could say industries. within more than one country, okay? And when you have industries in more than one country, you become a multinational corporation. 3.5 says, list some benefits for, for South Africa of having multinational corporations like Tata opening factories in the country. Well, very important, it creates jobs, okay? And for any sort of developing country that's heading towards becoming a developed nation, job creation is one of the most important things we need to understand. Um, if you have job creation, you can maybe increase quality of life 
Okay, so in other words, the, the people are earning an income, so they are generally well better off. Okay, they can provide housing. They can start training maybe some of our, our laborers to become, we'll turn them from unskilled laborers into skilled laborers. So there are numerous benefits by placing these companies within South Africa. Question 3.6, suggest reasons why some people are opposed to the presence of multinational corporations in South Africa. What you find, grade 11s, a lot of the time is the minute that these companies come in, they sort of, um, you know, take advantage of the labor within a country. They um, will create a huge amount of pollution in that, which will go against our country's name. So there is a lot of opposition to these companies being placed within the South African borders. All right, moving on to our last question. Question four it says, the value of imports and exports for selected countries in 2010. We've got different countries and we have their imports, their exports, and we've got three different groups. Okay, so they've grouped different countries together and then they show us the imports and the exports for those various different countries. So, number 4.1 says, which country in the table earned the most from its exports? So you have to go back and now look specifically at the export column. So that's an export column, there's our second one, and there's our third one. And I don't know if you've noticed, but what you'll tend to see is that they've been grouped according to good to bad sort of ideas. So the country that has the most exports we are expecting to find within group A. All right, and we see that if we look under exports in billions, China seems to have the largest exports. And that's why I've said to you, China has become this export-led country in terms of what they're sending out of their country. All right, so 4.1, the answer was pretty easy to find. It is China. Which country earned the least from its exports? So now we can shift our mind to maybe look at a country that is found in Group C. And if we look at our exports, okay, the Burundi at the bottom is only earning 0.07 from its exports. And the reason that Burundi is probably earning such a little amount is that it is a developing country and we've spoken before that the developing countries would be exporting goods in the raw material stage. Okay, so if we go back to our questions, question 4.2, the answer is Burundi. Which country in the table spent the most on imports? So now let's change pen color because we're looking at something different. We're looking at our imports. Okay, and we're trying to find the country that spent the most amount. And if you compare the statistics of the countries in table A, it's very obvious that the United States spent the most on importing goods to their country. All right, so question 4.3 is the United States. 4.4. How many countries earned more from exports than they spent on imports? So we are looking for countries essentially that are going to have a positive balance of trade. Okay, because if you spend more on exports than you do on imports, then, or sorry, if you receive more from exports than you spend on imports, you are gonna have a positive balance of trade. So if we go back to the table, we've now got to look through all the countries. So if we quickly compare, the United States spent more on imports than it did on exports. China spent more on, or received more from imports. So China is definitely one of the countries we're looking for. Germany also, okay, received more from their exports than they spent on importing. 
Japan, okay, received more for exports than they spent on importing. France didn't. So be careful about that, okay, because you kind of get on a roll there and you're like, all right, well, they all seem to be this way and that's not the case. You have to identify each and every single one separately. Um, if we go to group B, okay, you will see New Zealand received more for exports than it did well, it's spent on imports. Um, Bangladesh imported more, Croatia imported more, Jordan imported more, and the Republic of Congo actually exported more than it imported. Mauritius, okay, spent more on importing, Armenia spent more on importing, Lesotho spent more on importing, Belize, as well as Burundi. So the five countries that had positive balance of trade was China, Germany, Japan, New Zealand, and the Republic of Congo. Right. Question 4.5.1 says, use an atlas. Obviously, we don't have an atlas at our disposal now, but you should be able to have a particular world map with you. And it says, locate all these countries on a world map. How many of the countries shown are landlocked? And the question tells you and explains to you, if you're not sure, what is meant by the term landlocked. It's a piece of land that is, oh, sorry, a country that is completely surrounded by land and has no access to an ocean border. All right, so they wanted you to go back to um, the table and obviously try and identify these places. The three that I can tell you are landlocked is definitely Lesotho, okay, because Lesotho is found within the borders of South Africa and therefore it is a landlocked country. Burundi is the second landlocked country and Armenia is also a landlocked country. So what you would literally do is get a world map in front of you, which most of your textbooks and that would have, and you can identify where these countries are. And if they're completely surrounded by land, having no access to an ocean, they are considered a landlocked country. The second half to that question says, from the countries shown in the table, would it be fair to say that landlocked countries have lower volumes of trade than countries countries with access to an ocean. So if we go back to the three landlocked countries that we have identified, you will see that the amount of trade that those three countries are doing is very, very, very small. And it's possibly due to the fact that they have not got access to an ocean border, which means Great Levens, if they don't have access to an ocean border, their only means of trade is either through roads, Okay, through railway lines and through air travel. Air travel is exceptionally expensive and those are all developing nations. So the amount of um, export and import trading that those countries are going to do through air travel is very, very limited. They possibly are only trading through road and railway things. And in saying that, they would then only be trading with countries that are located directly around them as well. So yes, it is fair to say that landlocked countries definitely have lower levels of trade because of the situation that they are in. 4.6. Using trade as the only criterion, choose the most developed country from each group shown on the table. Okay, so we're not taking into account social development within the country. We're not taking into account any demographic indicators. We are purely looking at their trading statistics. And therefore, the best idea here is the country that has possibly the positive balance of trade is going to be the best off country that we are looking at for this question. So if we go back to our table, and it's become very colorful, so I need to see if I've got a different color that we can now use. Uh, let's go for a thicker red, okay? In group A, where quite a few of my countries have very, very well-developed trading systems, if I were to compare the USA and China, purely based on the fact that China is exporting more than it's importing, I would say that China, okay, 
oh it's coloring it in now all right would become our most developed country within that specific group if i went to group b by looking at the different statistics we can see that the highest one there is going to be new zealand all right and in the third group which is a really really poor sort of group in terms of exports and imports but we had to pick a winner out of each group and in terms of that we would have to then say that Mauritius is probably the winner of that group so if we go back down to the question says using trade as the only criterion to choose the most developed country so we picked China New Zealand and Mauritius I would like to thank you for tuning into today's um, topic on trade and development I hope that you now understand how trading takes place around our country and that you found the questions very useful and how you should be answering them we hope you tune into our next topics and we look forward to chatting again